Welcome to the clinical podcast series brought to you by the American Academy of Optometry Foundation. Today's episode is from the Public Health Channel entitled, A Randomized Phase II Clinical Trial of Fentolamine Mesylate Eye Drops in Patients with Severe Night Vision Disturbances. I'd like to thank our host and topical editor, Dr. Ruth Hyatt, and our topical expert, Dr. Muriel Shornack. And now, it's my pleasure to begin today's podcast. Hi, I'm Ruth Hyatt, a fellow and diplomate of the Academy. This is the clinical podcast series. This episode will explore the use of fentolamine mesylate to improve vision in dim light. Our topical expert is Dr. Shornak, a fellow of the Academy. Hey, Muriel, can you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, I am here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I've been here since 1999 when I completed my residency at the Illinois Eye Institute. I'm a 1998 graduate of ICO, so if there are any ICO uh, mm-hmm. alumni out there, it's it's lovely to be with you. <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at the paper. So a randomized phase two clinical trial of fentolamine mesylate eye drops in patients with severe night vision disturbances was published in October, 2022 by PIPOs and colleagues. So I have to start by asking you, what is fentolamine mesylate and how does it affect the eyes? So my go-to whenever I run across something that I've never heard of before is a quick PubMed search. And I actually found the first reference to this as a treatment for hypertension in the 1950s. Uh, It's currently primarily used to prevent or control hypertensive episodes before, during, or after surgery. It um, has some vascular effects. I even found one paper uh, that suggested that it could be used for erectile dysfunction. Uh, It is a non-selective alpha-1 and alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. So it suppresses the fight or flight response. So what does that do in the eye? Well, pupils dilate with activation of the sympathetic nervous system. This is a meiotic agent, but unlike uh, tropicamide and pilocarpine, the mechanism of action is the deactivation of the iris dilator muscles rather than hyperactivation of sphincter muscles. So the authors found that it was well tolerated, it reduced pupil size, improved contrast sensitivity and visual acuity in patients with severe dim light vision disturbances But the next question is, what were some strengths of that study? So first of all, I found that the topic that they're attempting to address is very pertinent. I personally hate driving at night. I don't feel like I can see well. I see primarily patients aged 50 and over. And one of the most common complaints I get in that patient population is just difficulty seeing in dim illumination. So I had not heard of DLD or dim light disturbances before. I hadn't heard it called that, but certainly we all encountered in in clinics. So I think one of the main strengths of this study is just its topic. If we could find something that could help patients who experience symptoms like this, uh, I think we would make a big difference in a lot of patients' lives. So I have to admit, I'm always a little bit leery of industry-sponsored studies. Um, There's always a tendency to assume that they are going to design the study in such a way as to make their results look promising, but they really did a great job here of minimizing um, bias. They, first of all, devised a, a theory for treatment that physiologically makes sense. So if you can reduce pupil size, you're gonna reduce pupil size associated higher order aberrations. You're gonna give patients just a little bit of a pinhole effect, but probably not as much of a pinhole effect as a meiotic agent. And you're going to decrease the effect of glare um, with decreasing pupil size. So physiologically, making the pupil a little bit smaller makes sense. There would be reasons that this would help. And then they did a really good job carefully screening to identify patients who actually had dim light difficulties. Um, sometimes, you know, let's say that I'm uh, an industry executive trying to prove efficacy of dry eye treatments. Well, if I recruit a bunch of patients who have mild dry eyes, 
I might be able to show a, a good effect. Or maybe if I you know, choose a group of patients who have such severe dry eyes that anything helps, I might be able to demonstrate a bigger effect. But they did a really good job of deciding which visual disturbances they were going to address and then recruiting patients who actually had uh, deficits in those areas. The study and control groups were very similar in all relevant characteristics. And the data that they collected was completely reasonable to address the symptoms that they're trying to control. High and low contrast, visual acuity in various levels of illumination, contrast sensitivity, those are things that bother people who experience these symptoms. The endpoints also appear to be clinically relevant in addition to statistically significant. So the mean contrast sensitivity with glare remains in normal range with the treatment group, but is significantly worse in the controls. So um, that tells me that this is probably going to make a clinical difference for those patients. And then the thresholds for increases in visually visual acuity were actually clinically significant. We're talking about one, two, or even three lines of visual acuity improvement, not one or two letters of visual in, acuity improvement, which could be simply measurement error. So I think they did a good job of uh, designing the study as far as the theory behind the medication, recruiting appropriate participants for the study, and then devising meaningful endpoints. Did you identify any significant limitations in that study design, data collection, or even how they interpreted their findings? So I'm going to say something that's a little bit of a double-edged sword. So the data collection was very well controlled, and that is a strength when you're talking about getting clean data. But if you're talking about applying this to real world applications, it could actually be a little bit of a, a weakness because life is a little messy. You know, sometimes I might get glare plus a little bit of higher order aberrations due to a slightly larger pupil. So I understand that you need to keep your data collection clean, but life isn't clean. Life is a little bit messy. So, this study, as, as is the case with a lot of studies, um, took a look at lab conditions versus real life conditions. So I'd be really interested to know if this would actually help me drive at night. And I'm not sure that I can say that it would based upon, um, based upon the data that was collected, collected and presented. So the other limitation is that statistically significant interest to, increases in acuity and contrast sensitivity were noted, but the improvement wasn't consistent across the board. So roughly one third to two thirds of treated patients achieved those significant improvements in visual acuity. 50% uh, or less achieved significant increases in contrast sensitivity with glare. So I think that yes, it could be helpful, but based upon the study, I wouldn't necessarily say that it would definitely be helpful for all patients. Um, this was also a small and relatively uh, homogenous group of patients with no significant ocular disease. I'm in my 60s, so cataracts are starting now to uh, cause a little bit of trouble in my eyes, and, and these patients were a little bit young to be experiencing any of those normal age-related uh, lenticular changes that could be contributing to these symptoms. And then this was only a one-time application. So what's the durability of the effect? Um, if I wanted to you know, drive from here to Chicago in dusk or dark, would that effect last so long that my distance vision would actually be compromised when it became truly dark as opposed to just those mesopic or dusk situations? So I think there's some questions that need to be answered, but the limitations are really limitations that are necessary when you're going to do um, any sort of a controlled study. So I was impressed by the design and um, their careful interpretation of the data that they found. So before you write this prescription for your patients or consider writing it, is there any other information that you would want to see? This medication was originally developed as a systemic medication. So I would want to know if there were any systemic side effects. And if there were, what would we do in order to mitigate those side effects? I'd also like to 
see if there were any ocular complications in a larger cohort. Anytime you put a drop on the eye can potentially be uh, a little irritating to the front surface of the eye. So I kind of like to get a, a better idea of the percentage of patients who experience that ocular irritation. I would also like to explore somewhat the effects of decreased retinal illumination with decreased pupil size in very dark situations. So is this going to negatively impact somebody's ability, for instance, to read a, a restaurant menu or um, particularly drive in very dark situations? And then the final thing is the cost of the medication. We were all excited uh, about a year and a half ago when a medical treatment for presbyopia was developed and introduced into the market. But um, I think the cost of that medication has dampened enthusiasm for uh, its use in at least some of my patients. So I have to agree with that too, with that analysis. Um, I thank you for your insight on this paper, and I thank all of our listeners to for listening to this episode of the Clinical Podcast Series. And a special thanks to CooperVision for their educational grant to make it all happen. Thank you.